this is Third Degree, and in this week's edition of the show, we have a very special guest. Grossa Michelle is our former First Lady, wife of Nelson Mandela, and an international advocate for the rights of women and children. She is also the only woman in the world to have been a First Lady in two different countries. First, as the wife of former Mozambican President Samora Michelle, and of course during Madiba's presidency. We travelled to Kunu, where Mandela has retired and where Grasa has taken up residence when she is not travelling for work purposes. Here we met her in the informal and relaxed atmosphere of her Kunu home. A very different place from President Jacob Zuma's 248 million rand in Kandla residence, around which a massive controversy is swirling. We spoke to Grasa Michelle on a range of issues affecting our country. It's been a tumultuous year. Debate, challenges, legal battles, protests against government. The controversial e-tolls, the pain and anger around the spear. Discontent on our minds, on our farms, in our communities over failed service delivery. The ousting of Julius Malema. The shame of Nkandla. And worst of all, the lethal cocktail of failed leadership that culminated in the horror of Marikana, in which 34 striking mine workers were killed. Through it all, an increasing sense of disconnection. We are disconnected from our struggle against apartheid. We are disconnected from the legacy of Mandela's revolutionary and reconciling leadership. We are disconnected from each other, which is why police could shoot minors with seemingly little sense of remorse. We have forgotten how to talk to each other. And with Mangawong just around the corner, and South Africa's future leadership a hotly contested site of struggle, we spoke to a woman who is regarded as a wise and struggle elder, former First Lady, Nelson Mandela's wife, and a powerhouse in her own right, Grassa Michelle. We travelled to Tlunu to speak to her, where she now stays with Madiba, who we are happy to report is doing well. We wanted to know from Grassa Michelle why do we battle to talk to each other in South Africa? It's not new, is that uh, South Africa acknowledged from the onset that uh, it was not enough to have a democratic architecture in place. What I call institutions and uh, legislation, that, was, that alone was not enough. Which is beautiful. I mean, you have this beautiful constitution, you have legislation which is very, very progressive. We need to learn to communicate in a different way. And because we are not able to find, I mean, some sort of a framework in which we deal with this, how do we relate to one another? Our pain comes first as we want to express ourselves. That's why we hurt children. We hurt women. When we had to talk to uh, our people of other races, it's, 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 it's aggressive. It's, it's without recognizing that we have too much in common, although there are differences, but we belong to this soil. We belong to this nation. We have all space here. So how are we going to live with one another in a peaceful, constructive, accommodating, and even you like, if you like, embracing way? I'm challenging people, those who have, uh, I mean, the moral authority, to find a way of uh, really devising a system of uh, conversations with ourselves. Perhaps the most devastating moment of 2012 was the Marikana massacre. We thought violence of that nature and intensity ended with apartheid. It seems we were wrong. And yet Marikana is simply the most dramatic manifestation of the endemic violence in South Africa. But it is represented on every level with the rape of the elderly and children and senseless, brutal crime. 
it has been happening. Maybe not as visible as Marikana, not as visible as the spear, but it is with us. And that's what I'm saying. We need to sit down and say, what has been done to us? And how do we deal with it? All of us. It's, you know, like Mampila has started these conversations with young people. It's a very commendable initiative, but it has to be much broader than that. Very, very, very broad. It has to touch families. It has to t touch communities. And as I'm saying, it has to go cross class, cross race, cross gender, cross age. And all this as a long conversation in which we dare to face the demons which we carry with us. It's almost as if people need some kind of psychological outlet. I think people need as some sort of catars. I would call it catars. I don't know how you would say it in English, but I'm thinking in Portuguese. Catarsis. They, yeah, catarsis. People need to take it out. They have to acknowledge and they have to take it out. And in a serene way, where you, you are very clear that taking it out, it's not against somebody else. It's a, it's a healing process in which you allow your wounds to bleed so that you'll be able then to, to stop the bleeding and you'll begin really the process of mending whatever are the kind of hurts you are carrying with you. Is this a sense, because we come from this patriarchal background, that we're actually too proud to talk about our pain? Yes, it's part of it. It's part of it. But, uh, we are 19 years old as a democracy. We are, we are no longer, I mean, adolescents. We are grown-ups, and we have to accept that there are things which we, even of our traditional setup, which we don't want to destroy them, but we need to revisit them and take from them those positive aspects of what uh, define us as Africans. It's fine, but there are other things which... Uh, they have nothing to do with Africanness. Coming up, when culture is used as an excuse to oppress others.